There is no sign of German fighter cover. Of the 240,000 men in the city, 70,000 are remnants of annihilated rear area and supply units, such as bakery and butcher columns, maintenance units, and so on. None of their personnel have ever seen actual combat. These are organized into so-called fortress battalions and then thrown into battle across the city. I know from experience how useless such ragtag formations are. Most men now have winter clothing, but warm quarters are rare, and there is a chronic lack of firewood. There are no places to warm oneself up. The only wood in Stalingrad comes from the house ruins and from several wood depots in the city. However, these are under constant artillery and sniper fire, and it is forbidden to forage for wood during daylight hours. Most of the little wood that is available has to be sent to the field kitchens. No food without wood. All this, the cold, no food, constant action, no sleep, no warmth, and the constant exhaustion, lets the men fall by the hundreds. After a few weeks of combat, even we looked haggard, tired, and worn out. But we always had food and regular rations. The comrades in Stalingrad have nothing. The Russians there, however, have everything, mostly from German depots. Tins of plums, peaches, peas with bacon, and rice with beef. How times have changed. The comrades have told me that they had known about our attack on December 12, 1943, from Kotelnikovo, and that flak and tanks had been amassed in the southwest of Stalingrad, from where they were supposed to fight their way towards us. They also told me about the great sadness that had befallen everyone when they learned that we had been forced to withdraw. Now they all hope that another relief attack will be launched via Kalak. Well, that is all I learned about Stalingrad. Here in the hospital, there are new admissions daily, new comrades to talk to. Lieutenant Schmidt, whom I have come to like since I first met him at Tagenrog, told me about the terrible mood in the encircled city. Some of his men had deserted to the Russians, where they were given a bowl of food before being photographed. Then, after further interrogation, they were shot. At one point, a man from the 60th Infantry Division deserted to the Russians, and they made him broadcast messages to his former comrades via loudspeaker, telling them how well he was being treated by the Russians. There are certain elements who prefer this kind of treason to the noble death of a soldier. However, in well-led units, such cases are the exception. A sergeant from the 100th Jaeger Division, a dashing and courageous young man, told us about the fighting in the Red October factory and the close quarters at which Russians and Germans fought there. He is from Styria, and many of his comrades serve as snipers. He described how they picked off Russian teams collecting water from puddles and shell holes. He had never seen such an enormous amount of hand grenades used in fighting among the ruins. He also recounted how he had set a house on fire using bottles filled with fuel, later ignited with hand grenades. It is highly interesting to listen to the comrades, and I have made an observation. The soldier from a second-line unit, like the baggage train, will tell a story in a completely different manner from an experienced front-line fighter, one of us, as I can proudly say. He will talk about the intensity of the artillery fire, the loud explosions, and use general terms to tell a story that mainly revolves around himself. The front-line fighter will speak about how he executed specific actions, the weapons he used, and so on. He has no need to describe the battle, the sounds and sights. We have all experienced that ourselves. It is now 3 p.m. and we have already turned the lights on. Russian Laura has just brought us something to drink. Krakow and the doctor are asleep, having finished eating at 2.30 p.m. Another hospital train has arrived and the new arrivals are currently being examined and bandaged. One of the nurses has just brought me some writing paper so I can start writing a few letters again. The nurses here are all from the Palatinate and the Saar. They don't quite correspond to my ideals. The women from northern Germany are a different breed. And the Russian women we see here, well, it's better not to waste words on them. Laura is surely the most noble among them. They are all dressed in shabby clothing, and Laura also has slit eyes like a Mongol and an oddly short haircut. However, we couldn't help noticing that the girl speaks excellent German and, in stark contrast to her unusual appearance, is quite clever. We have gotten used to her, and only a short while ago she asked us, with a sly glint in her blue, slanted eyes, 
whether the Caucasus was still in German hands, or if the Russians had repossessed it by now. Of course, we told her that it was still German, but she, and the other Russians too, heard a lot from our soldiers, and surely she has other, additional sources of information. She asked me on which front I had served before I arrived here. She might look like a farmer's daughter, but she has studied medicine for two years and qualified as some kind of sub-surgeon. Things are a bit different in the Soviet Union. There, something like a private practice does not exist. Doctors with her qualifications are employed as company doctors for health control and in the villages as baby carers and so on. The doctors who study medicine properly and obtain a degree later work in hospitals. Here in the German hospital, this is sub-surgeon is only allowed to do simple tasks, like serving food and making the beds. If they do anything else, like the time when Laura changed one of Krakow's bandages, she has to do so under the supervision of a German nurse. Outside, some craftsmen are hammering furiously on the window frames. It's quite a farewell concert, as today another train is supposed to leave, and we all hope that we'll be on board if it does. Yesterday evening, we three had ourselves carried downstairs into the cinema, where we watched a movie with Zara Leander. That was quite a nice change, although the effort to get there was something else. After all that limping around and being carried up and down the stairs, we were all exhausted and slept like babies right until the morning. 4 p.m. No train for us today. So far we have wasted nearly a week here and have only travelled 150 kilometres. There was a BVZ to Dnepropetrovsk, and if we had got on board, we would at least have been a little closer to home. And now we lie in our beds, annoyed. It's a shame that I don't have any Russian language books with me, as I have noticed that I've forgotten quite a lot of words since the campaign in 1941. Today, a female ethnic German was here in the room, working as a translator. It's terrible to hear our beautiful language spoken by these distasteful Russian proletarian types. Here in Russia, one learns to appreciate the advancement of German workers in recent years. Krakow and the doctor are downstairs again, watching another movie. I just had my plaster changed. I was surprised by how much I must have bled in the last few days. I have to make an effort to keep my leg still until the wound has healed properly. Now I am bored. The barber has just turned up and is now standing at Lieutenant Krakow's bed. He greeted us by wiping his runny nose with the index finger and thumb of his right hand, then snorted the remains up and wiped the mess off on his moustache and the hair on his head. There followed a good morning, with a much extended oo and a long rollinger, and then he started giving Krakow a shave. Krakow, by the way, can't even grow a proper beard. The barber is an older Russian, with a deeply furrowed face and a martial look, sporting an ice-grey moustache under his nose. The hair on his head, however, is pitch black, with only some white strands on the sides. He is of typical Slavic stock, like Marshal Pilsudski of Poland. He is a big fellow, with a heavy build and bony yet dexterous fingers. The biggest difference between him and a German hairdresser is that he keeps his mouth shut and doesn't try to force a conversation about the weather or politics on his customers. The nose incident aside, he is a very clean and cultured man, even wearing a white coat. The fact that the coat is, at best, infantry white and has a large brown stain on the right pocket is of no concern. Nichevo niet, that doesn't matter. Below the coat, most of its buttons ripped off and fastened around his belly with a muslin bandage. He wears the typical torn and tattered Russian gown. The buttons at the ends of his sleeves are missing too, but that doesn't matter either. A couple more muslin bandages do the job just as well. His status as a long-standing employee of the German military is proven by the pair of thick grey army socks on his feet, tucked into rubber slippers. He isn't wearing any other shoes. Indeed, our barber is a clean man. Before he starts working on his customer's face, he washes his hands with water brought in an old rusty tin, then dries his large hands with a newspaper page, which he completely shreds during the process. He is very clean indeed. With solemn movements, he begins to soap up Krakow's face using an old brush, missing half its bristles. We can be quite sure the missing bristles were lost while soaping the faces of Red Army soldiers who had been in Makivka before us. Remarkably, he uses hot water to shave Krakow, 
adhering to the old Russian school. From the dirty pocket of his once white coat, he pulls out a bottle of spiritus, likely stolen from a nurse, and douses a large swab of cotton wool, obtained in the same manner, with the sharp liquid the nurses use for rubbing into our legs to improve circulation. He places the alcohol-soaked cotton wool on a thin tin plate and lights it with a match. Once burning, he holds a small aluminium tray filled with a tiny amount of water from his rusty tin above the flame. Even before the cotton swab collapses, the water in the tray begins to steam. It's hard to believe that in Germany, barbers pay to have hot water boilers installed on their walls. The Russians just carry them in their pockets. Very convenient and practical. The Germans should simply copy this Russian innovation, which, with its open flame, also adds a great deal to the celebratory atmosphere. Now then, the dozen or so stubbles on Krakow's face have been thoroughly soaped up, and the barber pulls out a Russian officer's belt, the kind I took as a souvenir last year. He affixes it to one of the bedposts, and voila, a sharpening strop for his brand new shaving knife is created. The gleaming new knife fascinates me, and I can't help asking where he got it from. Surely it's not a Soviet product. And I am right. He tells me that he bought it at the German sutler's store. While talking to me, he starts sharpening the blade on the strop with the wide, sweeping, ritualistic movements reminiscent of an Orthodox Russian priest. Well, it is Sunday, after all. He then checks the blade's sharpness with his thumb and deems it sufficient to mow Krakow's stubble. But he's not ready to proceed with the shave yet. No. First, he wets another cotton swab with liquid from one of the five little bottles, which he arranged with military precision on Krakow's bedside table, and then wipes the blade with it. Then, very solemnly, the blade is set to work on Krakow's face. Lieutenant Krakow has closed his eyes and leaned back in expectation of the great event, having tied his towel like a bib around his neck. The doctor remarks that the bib makes him look even younger, and that he actually looks quite cute with it. Now the shaving has begun, and the old barber is gathering momentum for each cut and swipe of the blade by turning his entire body. Looking at him from the back, bent down over Krakow like that, one could think that he is a Muslim, repeatedly bowing down in prayer. After each stroke, he wipes off the excess soap in the palm of his left hand, as if paper has suddenly become a rarity. Soon the work is done. No, I was wrong, it is not yet finished. With his fingers, which he has used several times more to wipe his nose, he now runs over Krakow's skin to find spots where some thin stubble might still be hiding. A few more swipes of his German blade, and Krakow's face is as smooth as a baby's bottom. Now the next act of the grand ceremony proceeds, washing the face and applying lotion. With another swab of cotton wool, wetted in his rusty tin and doused with more alcohol, he rubs down the sideburns, lips and neck of his patient. Then the contents of a small red tin box are used to smear some gelatinous substance onto his hands, probably to make them more slippery. After that, he slowly and very ceremonially rubs the contents of another small bottle into Krakow's face. The entire grand procedure reminds me of the anointing during the administration of the last rites. And then the sacred ceremony comes to an end. The bottles disappear into his coat pockets and he gathers the little trays and bowls. He bows deeply when Krakow pays him with a few cigarettes. Goodbye, he says, then raises his hand, still holding the cigarettes, slightly above his head, in a gesture resembling a mix of a German salute and a papal blessing. Then the door closes, and the high priest of the barber's profession has left our dormitory. Our comrade, known among the nurses, themselves only just old enough to vote as the little boy, raises the baby-bottom smooth skin of his face into the sunlight and looks mightily pleased with himself. And while the smell of perfume slowly drifts away, we return to our usual pastimes. The doctor is reading, and I am writing. On this day, one year ago, a Junkers flew me from Smolensk to Königsberg. A year ago today, the war in the East had, for a little while, come to an end for me. Today, from my warm room, I am again observing the war from a distance. My two brothers in suffering and I are still stuck here. There is much traffic in the hallways and corridors outside, because today another fifty comrades are being released. Only the bedridden cases, like us, have to remain here. Now we have started creating a fuss, demanding to be at least taken to Stalino, 
and from there, with the sitting cases, to Dnepropetrovsk. It was to no avail. The doctors here don't care about anything. They just want to be left in peace. Slowly but surely, I am fed up with being wounded. The gratitude of the fatherland is not very uplifting at all. Last night, a captain serving on some corps staff arrived to spend the night here. He told us some amusing stories about the Romanians. He himself had recently had a streak of bad luck. His staff headquarters had to flee from the Russians no fewer than six times. And during the last escape, they managed to capture a staff motor coach full of top secret documents and the best uniforms of the general in command of the corps. Yes, still in Makievka. We have been here so long that we have even been informed of the hospital gossip. This whole place is really starting to get on my nerves now. Yesterday, Laura told us what an absolute mess this place is. Later, Agnes, the little nurse, came in to cry on our shoulders, followed by Marie, who told us a few additional things. I am well informed now. The next time I get to the front, I will be doubly afraid of catching a bullet, as this will result in yet another odyssey through war hospitals like this, where nothing works as it should, a situation unbelievable to anyone who hasn't experienced it themselves. When Laura left and closed the door behind her, she summarised it all by saying, This is not a hospital. It is very clear that the Russians are absorbing all information regarding these kinds of deficiencies in our medical services, and that includes Laura. We have to take greater care to ensure everything is running smoothly and be far more suspicious of the Russians who work for us. The things happening here would be severely punished in a fighting unit. Here, however, they only result in a few days of arrest. But anyway, I don't want to rehash the gossip again. Yesterday, after Captain Holoben left for Stalino, a lieutenant suffering from severe frostbite on both hands was brought to our room. He is an infantryman, just like Lieutenant Krakow, and comes from Pomerania, not far from Krakow's homeland. Now we have two bachelors in the room, and a balance of banter has been established. For the foreseeable future, we'll have to stay in Makievka, as there is no transport available for us. It seems that troops are being concentrated somewhere in the area, and all available transport is being used for that purpose. The new sergeant in charge of our ward informed us about it, followed by the assistant surgeon who told us the same. This month, we are not getting back to the Reich. The question is whether we will ever get back at all, or even as far as Kiev. But what can I say? After a long night's sleep, the world doesn't look as bad anymore. I can't change the situation. I'll just wait until I can at least limp around without assistance. 3.30 p.m. Until a moment ago, one could read without the electrical light, and after shouting for about ten minutes, Nurse Gretel came in to switch it on for me. I am alone in our room. Flamme, our new man, along with the doctor and Krakow, are downstairs watching a movie. Flamme has given me a book to read, and I am trying to kill time with it. It's wasted either way. Today we were informed that it is most likely we'll be taken away from here in an express leave train. We are sitting fully dressed on our beds, waiting for what will happen next. It seems that the having to stay here story was nothing but a latrine rumour. We have received our rations and are now waiting to see if Lieutenant Krakow, infantryman, unmarried, unblemished and unshaven, will be kissed goodbye by Nurse Margaret. She has shown a lot of interest in our little boy, much to our amusement, I must say. But later, Nurse Laura told us that Marg has already given her heart to a tankist downstairs. But who knows, she might still appear. At the moment, it is a bit chaotic here. All our packed bags and suitcases are littering the floor. My stuff is next to my bed, including my sword, the Cossack sabre, the old fur hat from Poklobin, and the gloves from Zalewski. Both will be very useful on the journey ahead. Katya, the red nurse, has packed my toes into plenty of cotton wool. Again, I'm a bit worried about the journey. The cold is really concerning me, but I have survived worse than this. The hospital here is a shithole, and I'm glad to be leaving. We are rolling, yes. Contrary to all the rumours of the past weeks, we are now heading to Germany. We are sitting in leave train 844 from Stalino to Brest-Litovsk, and I have an entire bench to myself. I can stretch out my legs, and I have placed my briefcase on my lap, where it forms a sturdy surface to write on. That way, I am able to write a few lines about my recent adventures. 
Yesterday, we had to wait for a long time before anything happened. There was enough time to eat lunch, which consisted of bean soup with meat, also known as radio soup, as it makes itself heard in two hours, or special announcement soup. Those who manage to find a piece of meat have to make a special announcement. At 1 p.m., we were moved to the drafty hallway where I called for the head physician. The poor man is in a very bad state because he is slowly turning blind. His face is getting fatter from doing absolutely nothing and is now slowly growing over his eyes. Once we arrived, I sent him to fetch the paymaster to talk about the poor provisions. When the paymaster turned up, a debate was held right in the middle of the hallway, surrounded by grinning soldiers. That had a good effect. He left with his tail between his legs and promised to sort out some extra rations for the journey. A coach took us from the hospital to Stalino into a soldier's home, where we arrived after four hours. It had taken us four hours to travel 12 kilometres across the icy, snow-covered roads. In previous years, the Russians have built lots of enormous multi-storey buildings. I don't see them in the negative light in which they are described in the Goebbels press. I see them as warning signs of a major threat, the dangers posed by the emerging Soviet bourgeoisie. One day the Russians will have all the things that we have, but their workers will live better and in more modern surroundings than the workers in the fascist and libertarian states. And what will happen then? Anyway, I really need to stop thinking that way. But we in the West need to keep our eyes open, and the Russian bear has awoken from centuries of hibernation. We need to listen. By talking to the Russians, I have learned a lot. There is a new Soviet intelligentsia, a class surging to the top from the lowest level of society, and it does so at breakneck speed and on a wide front. It won't be long until it no longer requires a teacher. But anyway, I have distracted myself again. In the soldier's home, where we lay on straw sacks until 7pm, I met several old comrades from the division, riflemen from 114 and K6. Some of them remembered me well, and our eyes glowed when we talked about past and recent battles. One of them had ridden on my tank at Muratuo, and another remembered how I had finished off that 52-ton tank. Krakow lay next to me and listened to our conversations. Then the subject changed to our most recent losses, and I found myself shocked. Kelatat, Jung, Captain Jonas, Count Plettenberg, too many to list them all, but among them were Stocker, Zollenkop's adjutant, and Fage, the Admiral's son, recently serving in the 16th Panzer Division, all of them fallen. First Lieutenant Schneider has lost an arm, and Wissenmann has fallen. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. Should we win, this victory has come at a high price. Again, the best within our ranks have fallen. They also told me that Comrade Scheibert has won the Knight's Cross. I am sure he deserved it. We quickly got tired and slept for a little while, until a man brought the news that a coach was waiting outside to take us to the station. At 9pm we sat in the train. Together with the other officers, I am now sitting in an old third-class express wagon, which offers enough room for us and our huge piles of luggage. The benches are short, but I can stretch my legs across the aisle in the middle of the wagon. This is not too difficult with my plaster cast, and I rest the left leg on one of Krakow's crutches. Still, it's more comfortable than in the turret of a Skoda tank. From Stalino, our journey took us to Yasinovataya, and from there we continued on the German-made main railway line via Konstantinovka to Slavyansk. At the moment, we are rolling towards Losovaya, and it will probably be dark when we arrive there. In Slavyansk, we drew rations and were each given a bowl of special announcement noodle soup. If things don't get worse, the journey will be quite bearable. Here in the cabin, which makes up half of the total space in the wagon, we also have a potbelly stove. During our last stop, some comrades managed to steal some coal for it. When the wind comes from the wrong direction, as it is now, the stove smokes quite infernally. But who cares? As the old saying goes, many have frozen to death, but no one has ever died from stench. Earlier today, when temperatures rose slightly outside, the steam heating kicked in. Now, however, it has switched off again. We are heading north. I slept well last night. It was almost too warm under the large pile of blankets. Outside, there's bright sunshine and a clear blue sky, but it is cold. 
The snow crunches under the feet of the women and prisoners of war who are shoveling snow on the station platform. Lieutenant Krakow has just prepared himself a wonderful meal using a big onion. We used to do the same, but being old veterans of Russia, we quickly gave up on using this ingredient when even the Russians started airing their rooms to get rid of the terrible smell caused by eating onions. Everyone is teasing Krakow now, telling him that he will soon stink like a Jew. The train is making slow progress. At the moment, we are stationary again. For what reason, no one knows. There are two locomotives at the front and another one at the back of the train. The latter only arrived last night after we got stuck on a hill. The doctor, Krakow and Flam are playing scat. Some officers from another wagon have come over to watch them play scat. There's a captain and a commander of an armoured train unit here as well. At Chernishkov, he was in command of two trains, one of which I have photographed. His trains were then attached to Gruppe Stahl, and he was delighted to hear that Stahl, a colonel and Kampfgruppe leader in a Luftwaffe field unit, had been decorated with the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross. I had read about that in a newspaper while I was still in the hospital. The same newspaper dated 3 or the 4th of January, which mentioned our 6th Panzer Division in the Wehrmacht report. This was only due to the merits of Major Bake and the engagement where the 37 Russian tanks were annihilated. I will surely learn more about everything that happened there once I am back with the Ersatz Abteilung. I have to admit that it hit me quite severely to learn about the number of officers killed in SR-114 and K-6. By now, nearly all the old brothers-in-arms from the first campaign in Russia have either fallen or been wounded so badly that they are unfit for duty anymore. In our army, the ratio of men at the front to men behind the lines is supposed to be one. Eight, meaning eight men serve in supporting roles to keep one fighting man in the trenches. We are told that in the Russian army, where the pool of available manpower is much larger than ours, that ratio is one, four. The Reds don't require such a massive overhead organisation. The Russians have enormous human resources, and we allow our shirkers to serve behind the lines. 9am. We are still not in Poltava. We are currently rolling through the first proper forest I have seen in ages. This makes me rather happy, because it is a clear sign that we are moving further north and closer towards Germany. 10 a.m. We are standing in Poltava station. Lots of people are walking past our window, all of them with some duty here at the station. A proper mix of people and races. Italians, Turkmens, Uzbeks, Ukrainians, Slovaks, Romanians, all of them brothers in arms. We have just had our photo taken with the kind assistance of an Italian comrade from the Alpini the Italian Mountain Infantry. I have to say that their kit isn't any worse than ours. There are lots of different uniforms to see here, including those of the OT, the Reichsbahn and the Red Army, along with rows of prisoners of war who are waiting to be transported to camps. It can't be much more colourful in the camps of the English and the Americans, only that the English have millions of Indians whom they can force into their service. We should raise our own auxiliary formations from Russian volunteers. With those, we could then defend the coasts of France and thus release several German divisions for service here in the east. And in France, they couldn't defect to Belov's partisans either. I would really like to command such a Ukrainian or Russian contingent. They'd certainly be more useful than a German furler battalion. There are lots of Ukrainian militia at the station, all young, strong and healthy lads. Why use them here on station duty? That's a job for our older Landerschutzen. Why should they serve in France, committing adultery with the French ladies? And what about all our divisions guarding the Channel Coast, like the 302nd, 304th and 306th? They would be good for service in Russia. Again, I can't help but notice that Russian women are employed in hard physical labour. The railway employs entire working columns consisting only of females, heaving sacks of coal, shoveling snow and sawing wood. They are wrapped in thick quilted jackets, wear fur caps and head shawls, and have cuff bands that read Deutsche Reichsbahn. We have a whole lot of Red Cross nurses here on our train. They are far better equipped now than they were at the beginning of the war in Russia. Now they all have thick felt boots, fur caps and vests, quilted jackets and ski trousers. Our hen house here mainly originates from southern Germany. 
We are standing in a goods yard and a few police officers have boarded. We, and the captain in particular, are now making fun of them. With their fat behinds, these police officers are sitting here telling us that they are on the way to the front. However, the front for these individuals will likely be about 30 kilometres behind the actual front line, in the best case scenario. I'm getting tired of these people. The tantalising smell of toasted bread is wafting through the train. Toasting bread has become very popular here in the East, where bread is usually either mouldy or frozen. Because of this, the soldiers have started toasting the bread on oven plates and the like, until the slices are dark brown and crispy. Any mouldy taste disappears after this treatment, and it also thaws the bread, which goes without saying. There's a lot of activity here at the station. We are drawing supplies, which is why we have to wait so long. On the track next to ours, there's a train full of comrades from the SS Das Reich. They are already disembarking here in the area of Kiev. There are also some hospital trains in the station. They can move much more quickly than we do as they can prepare their own food and only need to stop for a locomotive change. I wish I could travel on one of them. It would get me home much quicker. Lieutenant Krakow has turned out to be a hysterical and quarrelsome man, not someone I could be around for extended periods. His complete lack of self-control is really getting on my nerves. The doctor, however, is a well-educated and calm character, just like Lieutenant Flam, who, even at only 20 years old and sometimes a bit phlegmatic, turns out to be great company. Our caretaker, an OT man from Hanover, is completely useless. He has failed again to find us any food. Alternatively, he either fails to locate the coffee kitchen or, if he does find it, lets some soldier snatch the last coffee away. He is a painter by trade, and I am sure he could even make our old man lose his patience. A train of the SS loaded with VW Schwimmwagen is currently rolling through. We saw a lot of those in France during exercises. I wonder how long it will take until there is nothing left of these vehicles. Things are lost quickly here in the East. I am puzzled by our slow progress. We have been on the rails for three days now and have only just reached Kiev. By now we should have been in Brest. God knows when we'll arrive in Germany. The train is now racing towards the old Russian border at great speed, with dense forest on both sides of the line. Our eyes are tired from looking out at the white snow-covered landscape. Now the sun has disappeared below the horizon, and it's clear that we are approaching the west. It's 4pm, but not entirely dark yet. The three other gentlemen are playing cards. The train is going so fast that it is hard to write. We stop on what was once Polish territory, and one can see the difference between Eastern and Central Europe here. Suddenly the houses have straight walls and are built of stone. The fields look good and are placed in a logical manner. Even the forests appear more tamed than those on the eastern side. We arrived at Brest Station at 5pm. After handing over our luggage, we and all our belongings were sent for delousing. The officers underwent delousing in a delousing train at the station. The delousing of the enlisted men was completed much more quickly, as they didn't have as many special requests as the officers. I was part of the second group, which, stark naked, waited in one of the wagons. With us sat a colonel of the pioneers and the old Captain Dressler. It reminded me of the advice we used to give recruits, to just imagine their colonel being stark naked if they were too nervous when facing such a high-ranking officer. That's what I was thinking about while we sat there, naked and devoid of any rank insignia. I then had the idea to remove my plaster cast, using the excuse that I had discovered lice beneath it. It was quite a task, and while I managed to remove the plaster around my thigh and calf, the cast around my foot was too thick and sturdy. I then soaked the plaster under the shower, and I was pleased when I noticed that I could walk without it, even better than the doctor and Lieutenant Krakow, who don't have such a dressing. It's a wonderful morning, the sun is shining, I've slept well and had breakfast, and as I sit in the clean communal room of the collection point and write, we are all listening to the radio set on a shelf on the wall. It feels like we have peace. This morning I shaved off my beard. After a long journey, I have now arrived at the reserve hospital in Haste, the former St. Angela Hospital. In Brest, I couldn't write any more. We were examined by a doctor, and then our entire group was brought to the station, where a train was waiting for us. 
Loading all the officers' luggage was always a lot of work. I could easily carry all my things myself because I only had my sabre, a few blankets, my dispatch case and my black briefcase. Krakow, the doctor and Flamme always required additional men to carry their things and help with loading. And in Brest, this had to be done twice. The hospital is housed in the former Polish army barracks, which has its own railway connection, and it was from there that a train brought us back to the main station in Brest, where luggage had to be loaded onto another train. From Brest, we travelled in a second-class wagon to Frankfurt. As usual, I rested my legs on Krakow's crutches, which made for comfortable seating. The train was nicely heated. Our train was supposed to carry only wounded personnel from the Eastern Front, but in Brest, a major from the local field post service boarded. We tried our best to get him to leave again. The medic sergeant, supported by the murmured approval of the officers on board, applied a mix of polite and impolite measures to usher him out of the door. However, the train guard intervened and allowed the major, who had some kind of important passport, to stay on board. We tried to ignore the older officer with his billiard ball shaped head. We arrived in Frankfurt, Oder, on the morning of the 30th of January just as the civilian workers were entering the city. Suddenly, we found ourselves with our straw shoes, fur caps, overcoats and luggage, surrounded by a mass of workers. They stared at us as if we were apes in Hagenbeck Zoo. A man shouted, the poor soldiers. We would have liked nothing more than to punch them all in the face. At the medical collection point, housed in an old grammar school, I didn't end up in the same room as Krakow and the doctor. I had been outside guarding the luggage, and by the time I came in, the first floor was already full. I didn't want to stay in the Mark Brandenburg region, and after a bit of spying around, I learned that there was a train leaving for Cologne in the evening. With a few gifted cigarettes, I secured a spot on the reservation list. After lunch, I went into town accompanied by the Colonel of the Pioneers. Our goal was to make a phone call home and do a little shopping. I urgently needed a walking stick now as in Germany I could not use my sabre as one any more. In a café, we listened to a speech by Hermann Göring on the radio. I had very mixed feelings about the whole Stalingrad situation. We then bought a couple of walking sticks, made our telephone calls, and limped back to the grammar school, from where, after a substantial dinner with lots of German beer, I was transported to the station again. When the train reached Vloto on the Weser, I talked to the staff doctor, asking him to register me as unfit for transport when we reached Bielefeld. He understood why this was necessary and gave me a referral for Bielefeld Hospital. A medic was to help me off the train, where he was to call the hospital for me, announcing my imminent arrival. However, the train only halted at the platform for a few minutes. Then the whistle sounded, and it pulled out again so quickly that the medic barely managed to jump back on board. He didn't have time to call the hospital. I was lucky. I went to the local command, where I received a train ticket to Paderborn, and, after a pleasant journey, arrived at Paderborn station on the 31st of January. From there I made a call and soon a car pulled up, taking me into town where I had dinner with a few lieutenants of the regiment. After such a long time, it was very interesting to be in the old city of Paderborn again, a visit that revived many old memories. On Monday, I reported to Salbach and spent the rest of the morning with Funk, who is now Salbach's adjutant. Chubby Lothar Herberts, who had also just been discharged from the hospital, joined us, as did old Wilhelm Lope. After lunch, joined by a Mr. Langer from Osnabrück, we went into Funk's room, where the four of us emptied two bottles of Steinhager and another two of Italian vermouth. I later went out to fetch my coat. Funk had returned to Salbach's office while Lope and Herberts continued drinking. We had all agreed to go out together in the evening to have dinner and a few more drinks in Horn. Funk came to meet me, and together we returned to Lope's office, where we found him lying in a large pool of vomit, stinking drunk and gasping for air. Fatso Herberts was nowhere to be seen. He was probably lying unconscious in some gutter. We decided not to go out after all, and I went to bed early. At 5 a.m. I took the train to Osnabrück. I was picked up from the station by Ernst, who initially didn't recognise me with my fur cap and thick overcoat. He had brought a car, which quickly brought us home. In the evening we had canned peaches. 
Now I am in a reserve hospital in haste, in an officer's room, along with a few warriors of the Heimat Front. The food is excellent. I have now learned that removing the plaster cast wasn't a good idea, as I am now suffering from periostitis, meaning I have to stay in bed. Today, Sister Vitalis, a nun from Paderborn but acting like a butcher's wife, squeezed out an ulcer next to the wound. The bloody pus spurting from it soiled the entire bed, and when she tried to empty the ulcer further, she accidentally rammed one of her fingers into the open wound. The pain was so intense that I nearly fainted. But at least the ulcer is gone, and I received a new Rivenol dressing. Hopefully that will get rid of the inflammation. The radio is playing, and I am waiting for visitors who don't arrive. Better to catch some sleep. I had dinner, and visitors did arrive after all. Ernst brought me a tracksuit and a parcel from Annalisa from Naples. Without visitors, it would have been a rather boring evening. Outside in the common room, the radio is playing reports from the front made by the propaganda companies. Who listens to this nonsense? These reports are unrealistic, boring and good for nothing, at least for a frontline soldier. Sundays are always the most boring days of the week, and today is no exception. Additionally, I have a mighty headache. The doctor saw me earlier and told me that it could take up to two months until I am back on my feet. It's hard not to feel despair. If it weren't for the excellent food and care we are receiving here, I would already have deserted back to the replacement unit. There, at least the comrades would provide entertainment, and I would get all the news from the regiment. Today at 3.30pm, Ruth gave birth to our son. He shall be named Wilhelm. He weighs 3,500 grams, measures 54 centimetres, has blonde hair, blue eyes, and is entirely healthy. So, I am now a proud father. Last Tuesday, I visited Ruth and had my first look at our son. He is a spirited little lad. Unfortunately, I didn't feel too well after receiving the Ubasan shot against the inflammation. Dr. Uthmoller took me with him in his car and also brought me back to the hospital afterwards. By now, I am fine again, better than I have been for days. Since the plaster has come off, my leg has become a lot thinner, and due to the inflamed wound, it is very hard to stand up. It will be a long time before the leg returns to its previous condition. One year ago today, Ruth and I were in Hamburg at a public talk about eternal peace after the Nine Years' War. That was on a Sunday, and afterward we went to a concert in the convent garden. Now we are a small family, and our boy is sleeping in his basket. In the meantime, I have been fighting in Russia again, and am now in the hospital with a shot-up leg. Yesterday my parents came from Hamburg to visit me. I am feeling quite good. The hole in my leg has shrunk a little, and pus is pushing small bone splinters out of the wound. I have been receiving massages for a few days now, and hot air baths under a red light box. I still believe that exercise would be more beneficial for rebuilding my leg than these artificial measures. What really bothers me is a constant headache. I'm unsure when I will be able to get rid of this side effect of war, as that seems to be what it is. I have seen staff doctor Dr. Dorflein, the ear, nose and throat specialist, who told me that this is a common side effect of combat stress, physical weakness due to the wound, and also the numerous concussions to my brain. The staff doctor and I have been to town to see a film at the cinema. We watched Wenn die Götter lieben, a film about Mozart. When we walked to the capital, I met a few old friends from my time in the Hitler Youth, all of whom are now in the army. Many from our age group have fallen, and after the war, they will leave a huge gap in our ranks. Many have been severely wounded and have become cripples. I can only hope that fate will grant us victory, so that we can properly care for these comrades. I must admit, the news of the evacuation of Rostov and Kharkov doesn't give me much hope that victory is imminent. But now, after listening to the latest speech of Joseph Goebbels, one at least sees that some action is being taken, and that in the coming spring we will give the Russians a proper beating. But that is still a long way off. I have seen and done enough at Stalingrad. We have to stand firm, survive, and do everything to turn this critical situation around. Later I went to the KMT, the former Alsberg department store. It has been completely bombed out and now there are concentration camp inmates cleaning up the debris. Looking at their faces, they seem to be Slavs. 
Russians or Poles, maybe also some Czechs. The Russians have the same numb facial expressions as the Russian prisoners of war at the front. The houses everywhere have been heavily damaged by bombing, and there are large numbers of foreign workers in chocolate brown uniforms, Dutch and Flemish workers serving in labour battalions, and tasked with rebuilding and repairing the damage. All of them are strong young men in their prime, the same age group which here in Germany has been sent to fight at the front. There was also a large group of female Ukrainian labourers. With their simple clothing and typical headscarves, they formed a stark contrast to the more elegantly dressed local women. However, they work well and hard, and there are never any complaints about them. In general, Russian women are accustomed to hard labour, much more so than the women here could ever imagine. These Russian women wear a patch on their sleeves, similar to the P, worn by Poles. It's a purple square with the letters Ost stitched onto it. They are also known as Ostarbeiterinnen, and in many cases the NSV, National Sozialistische Volkswolfart, has supplied them with clothing that makes them look quite presentable. Josef Goebbels recently gave a public speech in the Berlin Sportpalast, where he asked the German people to continue to stand behind the Führer and to bear the increased burden resulting from total war. We soldiers now understand that the coming summer will see the continuation of German offensives against the Russians, and even those who have so far been deferred from military service will be drafted. We see dozens of these people in the hospital every day when they come in for examinations of minor ailments. Between now and the coming summer, we can turn them into useful soldiers, and that should also be enough time to produce enough weapons and equipment for a new offensive. During this winter, the Eastern Front has again swallowed a great number of divisions, and we will not be able to overcome the loss of the entire Sixth Army any time soon. The comrades lost in Stalingrad were predominantly from Westphalian and Rhenish stock. In the coming summer, one man will have to fight for two to avenge them. Having spent the weekend at home with my wife and child, I now realise that I have become too accustomed to being at war. The peace and quiet at home isn't good for me, so this morning I quickly fled back to my hospital room. Here in the army, surrounded by my comrades, is where I truly belong. Here I am not only tolerated, but I have a genuine purpose. I can breathe freely again. I am free to do what I want and manage to regain some inner calm. I wonder how many others feel like they have lost their place at home after so many years of service, or if it's just me who feels like a misfit. Yesterday I had a phone call with Herbert in Hamburg. His Luftwaffe school on the Kerch Peninsula has been evacuated back into the Reich and disbanded. Herbert will be transferred to either flying personnel or a Luftwaffe infantry unit in Russia. For now, his unit is in Furstenwalde, so Herbert's first stint in Russia didn't last very long and who knows if he will even return there now. Anything is possible in the Luftwaffe. If my headache doesn't improve soon, I will ask to be sent to a spa. I am tired of this old woman's ailment, and being prescribed reading glasses only adds to my frustration, even though I must admit they help a little. Considering my emerging baldness, I can't deny that I am well on my way to becoming an old man. The result of six years of service and war? I can put some weight on my leg again and hardly notice the wound any more. I have trained hard not to limp and to stop dragging the injured leg behind me when climbing stairs. The wound is still weeping a bit, but considering the bone was broken and it's only been two months, it's healing quite well. As I write this, the air raid sirens are wailing. I won't bother going to the cellar until I hear the flak battery behind the hospital start firing. In recent days, these alarms have mostly been caused by individual aircraft and stragglers, which aren't worth the trouble of running around. Even though there are beds for everyone down in the cellar, there are nicer places to be. And when one finally gets comfortable enough to sleep, they sound the all clear, and we can climb back up to the second floor. No, not for me. I'd rather stay in my comfortable bed during the alarm. Yesterday the Tommies flew over Potsdam and Magdeburg, and on their way back, they flew over Osnabrück. The flak started firing everywhere, so staff Dr. Henschen and I went down into the cellar. While we were there, a group of nurses who had been woken by the alarm came down the stairs. Nurse Friedel, terrified by the sound of the 8.8 centimetres battery on the Sonnenhügel, had hastily thrown on a red silk kimono 
under which she was more or less bare. Because of this, she hesitated to come down the final flight of stairs into the brightly lit cellar. Someone gave her a blanket to wrap around herself before she finally came down. Nurse Marianne had swapped her shoes, wearing her left shoe on her right foot. Everyone laughed when she stumbled through the narrow corridor. The sound of the flak battery was so loud and terrifying that many of the women were utterly petrified. There was also a Serbian general with us in the cellar. He had fallen ill in the camp in Eversburg and is being treated here, as are a number of Frenchmen who are working in the city and are being decently treated. Today I had surgery on my leg. Dr Uthmoller scraped the hardened pus off the broken bone, and now I am lying in my bed with a splint on my leg, once again dependent on the assistance of those around me. This means the infernal ordeal with bedpans and pee bottles is starting again. My backside is sore from lying in bed, while outside there's glorious sunny weather. I have been into town every day these past weeks. The wound had closed up, leaving only a small hole to drain it, and I could walk quite well. However, the bone was still infected, and a large abscess had formed beneath the wound. This was drained today, and they also scraped the rest of the wound clean, removing several old scraps of trousers that have been in there since the day I was wounded. This morning I received a morphine injection, which made me very dizzy. Then Sola, the masseur, arrived and shaved the area around the wound on my leg. At 9am I was lying in the operating room, strapped to a metal frame, and they injected something into my arm that made me fall asleep. When I woke up at 12.30pm, Nurse Irene was sitting next to me, holding my hand, and told me that I had been screaming and crying in my sleep for over an hour. Nurse Ermgard Schneider informed me that in my morphine-induced state, I had told her not to be so terrified when she hears the Achtung, announcing the imminent arrival of the staff doctor in Hall 3, which is separated from the massage room by a thin wooden wall. But the truth is, she is terrified, and always tries to make everything look and sound as busy as possible. When the staff doctor is near, we support her in every possible way. I repeatedly slap my hand on my naked thigh to simulate the sound of a massage, while a comrade runs the motor of an electric shaver, changing the cutting length by pulling and pushing a lever, making the shaver howl like a dive bomber's siren. We also make sure that irradiation lamps are placed next to the beds. We make every effort to appear busier than we actually are. Nurse Ermgard is the daughter of the well-known and popular Osnabrück surgeon, Dr Schneider, and we do everything in our power to assist her. I am now lying here, waiting for the air raid alarm. I have received mail from Lieutenant Krakow, who is in a hospital in Bad Polzin, his hometown. He is feeling quite well there and has two more comrades to play scat with. In the bed next to me, there's an army pharmacist who had his appendix removed. He is receiving a lot of female visitors. When Ernst came to visit later, he and the pharmacist argued with me about the German population who now, during total war, allegedly don't want to be part of it anymore because the English keep dropping bombs night after night. Many people in certain circles, who hold no sympathy for the Nazis, are now trying to stir up unrest in the population, and they are the real problem, not the English bombs. I haven't written for several weeks, but a lot has happened during that time. Three weeks ago I received the news that I had been awarded the German Cross in gold. On Wednesday, they took another X-ray of my leg, which resulted in what I hope will be the last surgery they perform on it. This operation didn't go well for me at all. I couldn't eat for a week and had to vomit whenever I tried to eat something. When they changed my bandage one evening, I suffered a complete mental breakdown, December 1943. But now, I am sitting here in Nice as an instructor for the Bulgarians, teaching them our experiences at this combat school. The school consists of three fully equipped infantry companies, one pioneer and one signal company, a battery of light field howitzers and our tank assault gun training command. This is led by Captain Heimke of the Gross Deutschland Regiment, who has just arrived from the Reich. As the name suggests, the training command consists of one platoon with five Panzer IV, each with a long 7.5 cm gun, and a platoon of five Stug the Three assault guns, also armed with long 7.5 centimetres. I am in command of the tank platoon, while 1st Lieutenant Baldauf has the assault guns. 
Baldauf, a Swabian from the Sturm Artillery Lair Regiment, is a great comrade, and we have already established a brotherhood over drinks. His nickname is Balbo, and he is the most charismatic joker. The school, subordinated to the military attaché in Sofia, is commanded by Colonel Dr. Zimmerman, also a Swabian and an infantryman by trade. Then there is First Lieutenant von Gilser, the artillery and tactics instructor. The infantry instructor is Knight's Crossholder, Captain Siegfried Weber, whose brother, a U-boat commander, also wears the Knight's Cross. Weber is a fresh and sympathetic man who also lives in the Panzerberg, into which I will move once my predecessor, First Lieutenant von Schell, has moved out. Schell lost his patience with a clumsy Bulgarian captain, resulting in a complaint and the OKH sending him back to the replacement unit. The evening in the Theatre of Nice now lies behind me, and tonight I have to attend an officer's evening hosted by the Bulgarians in their casino. The evening at the theatre, which was hosted by our combat school, wasn't very impressive. I've organised better with my old company. The only noteworthy aspect was the building itself. I must admit that I didn't expect to see such buildings in Nice, especially one with a traversable stage. The soldier's home, like the theatre and other public buildings, is a flat-roofed construction, not popular in Germany but certainly favoured in the east and southeast. Surprisingly, in this town of 40,000 people, right in the middle of partisan territory, there was a room with hot and cold running water, central heating and clean modern furnishings. Yes, in Berlin I had a proper writing desk and a radio in the room, but I've quickly taken a liking to the place here. The gypsy band playing in the communal room in the evening makes up for the lack of a radio. I usually have my dinner in the school's casino in the Hotel Grand Orient, where in the evening one can buy two slices of cake and a big cup of coffee for 55 fenics. About the Bulgarian evening, I can say that I at least had my fill of food. They served an exceptionally nice Bulgarian red wine, and later an even better Serbian, slightly sparkling white wine, I sat next to the translator Etu, a chemical engineer who had once studied in Germany, in Aachen to be precise. On my other side sat a Bulgarian colonel who didn't know any German words except for Prost. The food was exceptionally nice too. First we had an oily white bean salad with smoked ham, followed by a meatloaf with lots of paprika, pickled cabbage and potato. As a dessert, the Bulgarians served bread and cheese. Between each course, we were served a large shot of Slivovitz. Later, the Bulgarians sang several very sad but also very beautiful folk songs in their language. It's a shame that we Germans did not reply in kind to sing some of our songs for the Bulgarians. The night came to an abrupt end when the air raid siren sounded and we all had to rush out to the bunker. Despite this, it was overall a successful and enjoyable evening. Today, we conducted a live firing exercise on the range where the Bulgarians surprisingly racked up a good score. A small incident occurred in the morning when we found that the firing range was full of sheep. We approached the old shepherd, who was wearing a huge fur hat, a sheepskin jacket and breeches with leather gaiters. We tried to make him understand that he needed to move the sheep off the range, attempting communication in Serbian, Bulgarian, Russian and even Polish. All our Bulgarian translators spoke to him in their language. After about 15 minutes, the shepherd started to grin and smile at us before saying in German, Scheifweg, ich laufen, schnell, schnell. He then started running down the range with his huge furry dog, shouting at his sheep, schnell, schnell schaif. While one of the Bulgarian translators turned to me and remarked, oh, it seems that he speaks German too. Later that day, I asked one of the Bulgarian officers about Bulgaria's influence on the Balkans and whether the Serbs would align with the Bulgarians, fight for Tito's gangs, or identify as Serbs. To get an answer, we pulled up next to an old man standing on the roadside and asked him. His reply was surprising. I feel like a German, he said. I am a German citizen because the Germans are now the masters here. The people here in the Balkans are an odd bunch. We were three men in an opal blitz lorry loaded with barrels and sacks of grain, accompanied by a few Serbian workers. The road was so bad that we couldn't go very fast, and when we turned a corner into another street, about half a dozen Serbs jumped onto the lorry to hitch a ride. The sergeant said they could ride with us, 
most of them would be working in German offices anyway, and they all spoke at least some German. However, when we passed a large group of very dubious-looking characters standing alongside the road, they bowed deeply and lifted their hats as they saw us. We all agreed that they looked like they had guilty consciences and joked that it would be best to string them all up, just to be sure. This was the last part of the memoirs of a German commander. If you haven't seen the other parts, I invite you to check out the playlist in the description, where all the parts are arranged in order. I want to express my deep gratitude for the support and positive comments I have received. I invite you to share your thoughts about these memoirs in the comments section.